This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 49 of Retired Racehorse Radio on the Horse Radio Network, brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products and Cashel Products. Retired Racehorse Radio is your guide to the adoption, care, and training of the retired racehorse, brought to you in cooperation with the Retired Racehorse Project and New Vocations Racehorse Adoption Program. On today's show, we jump into the tech world with Jen Roberto, one of the creators of the OTTB United app. Two-time Eclipse Award winner Natalie Voss joins us to talk about journalism in the thoroughbred world and her hopes of competing in the 2021 Mega Makeover. And we wrap up this episode with Leandra giving us another great training tip in our Adoptable Horse of the Week. Stay tuned. And they're off on Retired Racehorse Radio, the podcast that is your guide to the adoption, care, and training of the retired racehorse. This is Jamie Jennings, and I'm in Norman, Oklahoma. And this is Joy Hills in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and you're listening to Retired Racehorse Radio. Jamie, congratulations on such a phenomenal achievement I just saw on Facebook today. Oh, thank you. I just saw that on Facebook today too. <laughs> yes, for those who haven't seen it on Facebook, Jamie won an award for being the right horses, one of the good people for good horses awards of 2020 for being their top trainer. She's oh done gosh. phenomenal work and they noticed her for that. It's such an honor to be a part of that. I mean, I didn't even know about it. And then I got, you know, somebody sent it to me that I, I was the winner of the Right Horse Initiative's Good People for Good Horses Award. And I was like, is this uh, like me? me? <laughs> like what? No, you want, and I love the picture to you and Zoo. So fun. Uh, and What's even better? Okay, we're going to throw some stats out. Apparently everyone's seen your horses coming in and out, in and out, in and out. We love it because we love seeing all the new horses coming in. Jamie has helped horse and hound adopt. Well, they were doing 30 horses a year and they adopted 90 horses in 2020. And because I of must, Jamie. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. You, you know what? Horse and hound is an amazing organization. They are the, the people that they want the right horse to go to the right owner. And she said she did this at the beginning of December because we ended up with the final tally of 102 horses. Yeah. Some of our listeners homes. adopted some of them too. Yes. Which oh, is yeah. even better. So we're now going to be able to track those horses. And obviously, you know, your partnership here is our co-host and helping with new vocations and girl, pat yourself on the back. You deserve it. Oh my gosh. It was such a, such an honor to be recognized as the trainer that they selected. I mean, that just, those things don't happen to me. I don't win awards. I cheer people on that win awards. I, is it, that's, I'm blown away. Uh, what you know, awesome Monty's thing. a proud dad right now. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure he is. So, yeah, the 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 work that I've done with Monty Roberts has made all of this possible. I never could have helped all of these horses without learning the things that I did with him at Flag is Up Farm. And of course, anybody can go learn it. All you have to do is go take the courses and and become you know certified instructors through the program there. But I definitely couldn't have done it without all of that knowledge because it just teaches you how to quickly assess the horses and figure out what they need and, and go about all of the training in nonviolent ways. And the right horse is such an amazing organization and they have partnered with the ASPCA, which is also just incredible. So I'm definitely honored to be a part of the, the people that have been named. And, and I just, I'm st I'm speechless because I really don't believe it. I guess I'm well, not speechless. I talked for like five minutes, but anyway, no, I'm it's such an achievement. It's a great thing. And also our guest today too. I mean, we have Jen Roberto is coming on and she did a partnership to create OTTB United, which has helped adopt tons of horses already. I think they had over a hundred horses when I last looked that have been adopted through that app and more to oh, adopted or sold. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So definitely exciting there. And then Natalie Voss, who had a huge achievement, she swept the floor at the Eclipse Awards and that has in the journalism category and that hasn't been done since like the, I want to say like 1990, but um, yeah, 1991 and a man did it. She's the first woman Let to have ever say done that. that this episode <laughs> is full of girl power, right? 100%. 
I mean, those who don't know, you are making some life changes yourself and you are being so brave and doing them. And I'm really oh, proud of you for you. all the things that you're going through. Y'all can listen to the last episode if you want to get the more details, but you're just pushing through it. And um, yeah, girl power. That's right. Girl power for that sure. Kind of episode. And speaking of amazing girl power in women-owned businesses, we're going to hear from our title sponsor, Kentucky Performance Products, right now. She swallowed hard as they walked into the start box. She could feel his muscles tense under her leg. Five, four, three, two, one. Have a great ride. She didn't have to ask. He galloped out of the box and across the field toward their first training level course. His ears pricked. Her heart pounded. He attacked each obstacle with confidence, clearing them with room to spare. A huge smile broke out on her face as she crossed through the finish flags. She leaned forward and buried her face in his neck. Their bond of love and trust blocked out all else. This love story is brought to you by Elevate. Research proven to have superior bioavailability, Elevate supplies the essential vitamin E often missing from the equine diet. Its all-natural formula supports healthy muscle and nerve functions. The horse that matters to you matters to Kentucky Performance Products. Call 859-873-2974 or visit kppusa.com to order today. I'm pleased to have on the show Jen Roberto. And Jen, first of all, before we get started, you have to tell everybody where in the world you are right now. I'm in Ohio, uh, Lisbon. Uh, we are just south of Youngstown, as far, as okay. east, as, far east as you can get. Mm-hmm. Before you get into Amish country, or are you kind of there? No, we're not in Amish country, but we're pretty close to Pennsylvania. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Well, you are so heavily involved in thoroughbreds between, you know, racing them and then sourcing them to their next home. Tell us a little bit about how you kind of got involved in thoroughbreds. Sure. I started taking lessons when I was eight for riding, and I seemed to get along with the thoroughbreds the best. So when I was 17, my dad had a connection at the track with an owner who set me up with a job cooling out horses for his trainer. And then from there, they didn't have a a lot of work for me because they only had a few horses. So I went to a bigger barn and worked with that trainer. I actually got a couple horses to groom and then went off to college. And in between college and work and everything, I started picking up horses for resale. And then I met my husband and And that was in 2003. And his family has been in racing for four generations. So we work together with his family. And, you know, the racing is our bread and butter. And I do the resales on the side. Gotcha. Now you came up with something really interesting that as a former competitor of the makeover, which you are as well, it's a big thing during the makeover about the makeover marketplace and trying to get people to be interested in, you know, maybe purchasing the horses that you have worked so hard to retrain. And you came up with a way to just get everybody involved. Tell us about OTTB United. Okay. OTTB United was actually a collaboration with Amy Rubin and Uli Hildebrand out of Michigan. We have a large team, not just the three of us, but we were the three that started this with this idea. Actually, Amy came to me and I thought it was phenomenal because at the time it was right at the beginning of things going down with a pandemic. And, you know, we were having, we were seeing a lot of horses at the track that needed homes because people didn't really know what was going to happen with all these tracks that were closing. Mm -hmm. So they were selling off horses that they had really planned to keep to, to race, but they couldn't afford to keep them. We were closed for almost five months. And with no income to feed your horses, that's pretty tough. So when Amy approached me, you know, her her angle was also because Facebook was really cutting down on people being able to market their horses. The community standards for Facebook doesn't allow you to sell animals. So people were getting bans of 30 days and horses were sitting and had, you know, they weren't getting networking that they, they would normally get. So she came up with this great idea and she said, what about this app? What if we do this? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And we didn't realize that it was going to be so involved. But as we got into it, it just grew and grew and grew. And we're so excited about this. Oh my gosh. So has it, it has launched. There are horses on it that people can go purchase right now. 
Yeah, actually, yeah. We, I mean, this this app was born out of necessity. You can see horses all over Facebook, but, you know, with with the way their rules work, you're only supposed to use a, like a, a third-party website to share. And so as we were thinking about this, we were like, well, geez, you know, this is great. We can share these ads right off the app, right onto Facebook, and it's not breaking any rules. So we have, you know, we've got over 6,000 downloads already, and we just we just launched in November. So it's That's picking up pretty quickly. I got to yeah, tell it's, you, it's, it's been 6,001. All right, done. <laughs> so, I yeah. mean, I've been seeing the, some of the makeover horses being shared on the, the some of the horses being like makeover people, people that work for the, the thoroughbred makeover, sharing some of the horses um, from your app. And I was so intrigued by it. Why is this one a little bit different than some of the, some of the other websites, like Dream Horse and all those? Gotcha. Um, well, the biggest thing is everything that we offer. We have a lot of features that you can't find on other platforms, at least not in one, one place. You're, you're going to find sellers and, and buyers can get in there. And nonprofits are there and racetrack trainers are there and racetrack owners are, are getting their subscriptions and, and listing horses. You know, you can download this app and per- become a premium subscriber. You can make your profile and put up as many horses as you want. And in that, in, in that community that we have there, you know, you're searching for exactly what you want. You can filter for age and height and region and state, and you can do pedigrees and you can look through the race records and there's videos and pictures and everything you want all in one place without having to sort through thousands and thousands of horses on Facebook or any other platform. Um, you know, we've got uh, ways that you can get um, notified when your favorite seller puts a new horse on, or if you're watching a horse you really like, and that horse, you know, the price drops, you'll get a notification as long as you have selected that horse. Uh, with a, we have a little heart that you can click on, and and that pushes the notification right to you. It's really what we tried to do was build this community around this breed that we love so much, so that we have a place where you can find your horse, sell your horse, maybe even find a trainer. And we even have shippers on there as well. So it's sort of your one-stop shop. Oh my gosh. So you can actually just go on there, buy the horse, have it shipped over to you and answer. And you can talk to the seller the whole time through the app, see all the pictures you need. And Mm -hmm. then the purchase is made. Well, that, that sounds very dangerous. Not going to (laughs) lie. Yeah, it can be. I, I found myself found myself scrolling through and going, Ooh, I like that one. Yeah, this one's great. Ooh, I, I could take that one too. This is, it's such a great tool because you can private message sellers as well as shippers right in the app. Um, you don't have to go outside of the app to do that. You can even go on there and you can see where people have done testimonials uh, for you know, sellers or nonprofits that they purchased from or adopted from. They're right there, right within the profile. It's just very, very simple to use. You can put your horse on and it is live immediately as soon as you hit save. So is this something that say, like I work with Horse and Hound Rescue Foundation in in, uh, Oklahoma here. Is this something they can go on and list all of their horses that are adoptable and people can contact them through the app? Yes. Yes. And And you can also go, you can also go to those profiles and see what horses have sold as well. So you can see what they've had in the past and what kind of quality that they're bringing to the table, as well as what they currently have uh, available. Gotcha. So how do you guys make money? We get a small portion of the subscription fee, but to be honest with you, we developed this app to help out other people that are within our industry to, to be able to continue what they're doing. So when you get on the app and you can choose, there's a drop down menu and you can choose a reseller or a nonprofit that is your favorite that you want to support. And a portion of those proceeds go directly to those organizations. And we also give a portion to the retired racehorse project for every single subscription. So we're giving back to this community that we love so much because we want to see people continue to do the great work that they do. 
Oh my gosh, I am on this thing and this is dangerous. Okay, well, this is now I know, Joy, what we're doing for the rest of the evening is we're going to look at horses on the uh, the the app. Again, it's the OTTB United is the app. You can go to OTTBUnited.com if you're sitting in front of your computer. This is fantastic. Now, I can't let you go without okay. touching on an article <laughs> that I came across or Joy came across from Noel Floyd and it's entitled, I mean, this is what we do here on the show is talk about things like this. And the article is how an OTDB saved my life during my battle with breast cancer. Oh my God, girl, I was in tears reading this thing. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, they contacted me through another friend and asked if they could run a little story, which I was actually quite humbled. It, it, to be honest with you, it's just, you know, it was a shock of, to have a diagnosis and you know, you just, just like I said in the article, when I answered those questions, it, it, you just do what you have to do to, to, to survive. And I wasn't ready to give up, but it was hard. It was, I'm not going to lie. It was hard. The treatments and the surgeries. And um, I'm actually six weeks out from my last surgery today. So wow. I'm still recovering from reconstruction surgery. Um, but yeah, it's not something that I would, I would wish on anybody. It was very, very difficult. And you know, my horse, he's 15 this year. We raced him. We had him since he was two and he went off and, and, and was leased to a friend of mine for a few years when I had some back trouble. And now we just focus on dressage and he lives outside right behind my house. And that's how, like, I would get out and take a little walk and give him some carrots and hang out with him a little bit. And then I'd come home and I'd be exhausted the rest of the day. And, you know, mm -hmm. and each, each walk, it seemed to get a little easier and a little easier and, and, you know, they're, they're so healing. And, and if I, I didn't have that in my life, I think it would have been a lot more difficult to recover. For mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. And, and yeah. you've also become a bit of an inspiration for a lot of other women who have made appointments to get the mammograms, which are so important. You know, they say 40 is when you should start, but you're saying get, get it going at 35. Let's start making this a habit. Absolutely. My doctor actually said that at 35, you should start every other year as long as your insurance will cover it. And then if you have anyone in your family that's had it, that you should get genetically tested because there are women uh, that are getting it as early as 18, which is mm. really scary. Um, is. But yeah, it's definitely something you want to catch early because the earlier you catch it, the less invasive that treatment is going to be. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I mine had, mine had already metastasized. So I was very fortunate to find it when I did. Yeah. Well, you, you guys heard it, heard it here. You know, uh, the, the OTTB saved her life and now she's trying to save yours. So make sure you go get, get checked mm -hmm. out. Thank you so much for, for doing this app. This is going to be, I swear you're going to have a million downloads before you know it. I mean, this is such <laughs> a great idea. We hope so. <laughs> we it, hope it, that we can help as many people as we can. And I just wanted to mention that we are constantly looking towards the future with this app. I mean, our team has some really brilliant horsemen on it and the ideas when we have our meetings are just, they're fantastic. So we have some great things coming in the future and, and you just don't want to miss it. All right. Well, I'm going to send you a message because I've got to, I've got to get this rescue that I work with uh, logged on here. Can we add, okay. can we add somebody onto this so they can start receiving a, you know, it's a percentage of what you were talking about. Oh my gosh, there's so many lovely horses on there. You guys, it's you go check it out. It's OTTB United. It's on, it's free in your app store. Go download it. Tell all your friends. We're going to get a million downloads for this thing and help rehome all these horses. <laughs> Super. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Cashel Company helps you enjoy the ride with their full line of trail bags and tush cushions. From cantle bags to horn bags and everything in between, comfort and convenience on the trail is what Cashel does best. To stay up to date with the latest products and news, follow Cashel Company on Facebook and Instagram. And to find their products, visit an authorized dealer or visit cashelcompany.com. So we pretty much have a celebrity on with us today. We have Natalie Voss, who swept the floor at the Eclipse Awards this year. Welcome to the show, Natalie. Thank you, guys. It's really great for you to have me on. We're excited to have you. You have had some pretty uh, impressive achievements this year last year, you won two Eclipse Awards in journalism. Tell us a little bit about that. That's so crazy. <laughs> it, it was crazy to me, too. I, I really didn't believe it when they told me. <laughs> it, 
it seems that that's happened once before, but it was it was back in the early 90s. So I, mm-hmm. I it had not occurred to me that somebody could do it because I hadn't heard of it before. So that was mm-hmm. exciting. But yeah, I, there are two categories for the Eclipse Awards in writing each year. There's the News Enterprise, which is for obviously news or investigative pieces. And then there's the Feature Commentary um, Division. And I had... Um, uh, the winning feature for about an off-track thoroughbred who found his way back to someone who was important in his life when he was younger. And then the other category, the um, the winning investigative uh, entry was a three-part series on thoroughbred aftercare, looking at um, how far we've come and, and where we still have to go. So it was exciting to see off-track horses kind of spotlighted in both areas. Absolutely. And like, what a year to do it. I feel like 2020 was the year where so many off the track thoroughbreds and even standard breads found their forever homes. And now we have two awards that are going to thoroughbreds as well. I mean, they went to you, but about thoroughbreds. And for those who don't know, Natalie is the editor in chief of the Pollock Report. So she's kind of a big deal. Tell us how, a little bit about being a journalist in the thoroughbred world. Yeah. So I, I, Grew up watching racing on TV. Um, my only interaction with it really was the the big race days when they would be broadcast on CBS or NBC. There, I grew up in Central Virginia, and there wasn't a racetrack there at the time when I was a kid. So I learned about the business by reading trade magazines and newspaper articles as much as I could. And I had the idea eventually that you know I had always been told I was a, a pretty good writer that I was, you know, ahead of my grade level when I was in school on on the writing language arts end of things. And I always thought it would be really great to combine those two things if I could. I sort of had a brief phase where I thought, you know, no, I want to be training. I want to be out in the barn. And then I realized very quickly, you know, you should stick with where your talents are. Like, yeah, be in the barn sometimes for fun, but this doesn't need to be your whole job. Like, <laughs> maybe write about the people who are really good at this and then stick with that. So I did quite a bit of freelancing uh, towards the end of college and just out of college. And I had interned for the Pollock Report in school. And luckily, they, they had an opening for me at kind of just the right time. And I've worked my way up from uh, weekends. I think I was the weekend person when I first started working part time. and. Uh, it's been eight years, I believe, and I've managed to, to work my way up. So here we are. That is an accomplishment. I I mean, I studied journalism as an undergrad, and it is a competitive career track and extremely demanding. How do you balance your horse hobbies with that and have like a balanced life on top of being this amazing journalist? Um, I don't know if I could say I have a balanced life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I pretty much am either working or I'm at the barn and there really isn't any other in between. I, I work my day. I go out to the barn for an hour or two and then that, I usually That sounds come pretty back balanced for a hours. horse girl, so. though. That sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I figure I'm doing better than I could be. I'm fortunate that my, my husband is, is not a hands-on horsey person, but he is very supportive and, and helps me sort of juggle everything that I, I need to get done. And he's very good at sort of holding the horse while I do things. So that <laughs> that helps a lot too. So tell us a little bit about the horses that you have now, because you've been with the thoroughbred industry for a while. Do you have a thoroughbred yourself? So I just entered the sphere of thoroughbred ownership. I have had Percheron thoroughbred cross mare for the last 12 years. I think we've had 12 years together now. And she was kind of a, a former feral horse like she was a neglect case when she was young and I took her on kind of as a project helping a friend of mine out when I was in college I couldn't afford a horse so I thought oh I'll just help my friend with her project horse and you know then I'll move on and then I fell in love with the mare and bought the mare that I couldn't afford and <laughs> that's how it with goes. Her. <laughs> exactly I was just like I can eat mac and cheese but I'm not letting jitterbug go out of my life and so we've been together for a very long time now but she's you know getting older she's got I hope a few more years of riding left in her before she has to be retired. And I figured it was a good time to kind of look forward to the the next horse. And so I actually just got an off track thoroughbred in November and he's oh, the first one who's ever been mine. I've ridden them before I've worked with other people, but this is the first one who's actually been mine. So it's very exciting. That you know is what they exciting. say they they're like, like potato chips. Mm-hmm. You can't you're have, just have one. Uh, so you better start saving it up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Gosh, I barely have time for these two, so I don't know how I could do anything more. But, you know, everybody says that and they end up with a third one. So we'll see. Exactly, exactly. So and there are whispers that you actually applied for the makeover this year. Are you hoping that your new thoroughbred is going to be your makeover horse? Well, so I'm hoping I'm not. It's not like an end all be all goal for us, quite honestly, because the, the situation now is that like he he had a really minor ligament strain that he came off the track with, and it was very very small. But they didn't want him working before early January. Obviously, we're now into February, um, but we're waiting for a space to open up. So we've gotten through the the layout part, but now we're waiting for a space to open up at my trainer's main facility where there's a like an actual riding arena because where he is boarded right now, there's no place to ride. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of unsure when we're going to start under saddle work. And so I'm looking at like, okay, early October, you got to go to a giant show at the horse park. (laughs) I'd love to get you to a show before that, (laughs) but then you start backing up the timelines and there's COVID. And so Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that we'll get there, but it just kind of depends on, you know, how he comes along and what he wants to do and and how quickly he puts the pieces together. He's very smart. So, I competed we'll in it. I competed in it last year, and it's really no big deal. And adding the mega makeover really isn't going to be that big of a deal. You should be fine. Just go. You'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, it'll be a good time. <laughs> you know, I figure. I figure even if, like as long as I can mentally prepare him for the experience, I'll take him, even if I don't think we're going to be that competitive. Because I just sort of want to be part of the movement. Like I just think it's such yeah. a cool environment and all that. So I mean, even if we go, kind of knowing that we're going to forget half our dressage test if we do dressage or, or get lost in the middle of, of competitive trail. If we try to do that instead, you know, it's like, well, we went, we, we saw, we were there, we were part of it. And, and that would yeah. be worth it to me as long as it's not, you know, completely overwhelming for him. Absolutely. So it sounds like you haven't even decided quite on a discipline yet. Do you have a couple avenues that you're hoping he'll maybe move into for a career? Yeah. So I'm going to wait and see what he wants to do, like for an overall big picture career kind of thing. With my mare, I've kind of dabbled in like the lowest levels of a few different things. I grew up hunter jumper, but she is a draft horse and she's, I knew was not going to do the hunters. So um, (laughs) I did like baby level eventing, baby level dressage. We did like the, the smallest jumper shows that we could find, the smallest jumper height that we could find as well. So I I can sort of take him in whatever direction he wants to go as long as he doesn't want to go in, you know, over anything too big or too fast. Cause I'm not game for that. But mm-hmm. as far as like what I think he could reasonably do by October, I'm sort of eyeing the dressage because I have a fair bit of experience schooling that with my mare. But if I don't think he's ready for that, we have been kind of playing around with a lot of groundwork with him now while he's at the, um, the satellite farm. So even though I've never done competitive trail, I'm kind of looking at it like, well, he's not scared of very much. Every obstacle I show him, he kind of seems to accept after giving mm-hmm. it a minute of thought. And that seems like a good roadmap for a horse to do competitive trail. Um, but I'm still kind of learning about that whole world. So I, I'm yeah. not quite sure yet if that's the direction we'll go. But that seems like an option if we don't kind of get the under saddle stuff together as quickly. I love it. I love that you're putting your horse first. I think that's honestly what the makeover kind of is about. It's it's really grown to just showcasing the natural talent and the individualism of each horse. So I think it's amazing that that's kind of, you're letting him choose his own, pick your own adventure, if you will. Now I have to ask, because you are a journalism, do you think that you'll be documenting your your journey from applying with the makeover, rehabbing and taking him all the way through? So I really hope so. I I announced that I had him in early December in a column that I did for the Pollock Report, and people still ask me about him just based off of that. So I think that there would be kind of a following if we did like a regular blog or something. We're we're kind of hoping to put something together in the next few weeks, if, if nothing else, just because obviously he has quite a few fans. It was it was kind of a cool story how he and I got to be connected up. So I think people have kind of related to that and that's uh, inspired a lot more interest than, than there might normally be. And so, you know, there's so nothing that going, there's nothing wrong with adding a little extra pressure to your whole oh, makeup. Yeah. Nice motivator. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So yeah, of course, you know, just the entire world will know if you fail. You'll have to admit it yeah. in writing. No big yeah, deal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whatever. I mean, I did it on the radio. I was like, oh my god, what if I fail? I'm gonna have to like come on and announce it to everybody. So you know what? I made it. You can do it. Just suck it. We can do it. Do it again. You got it. And Jamie had a whole like fan club there too. So it wasn't just pressure for the Aww. radio. Like they were there watching. Yeah, that was. I'm oh, surprised no. we didn't make T-shirts. It was. It was a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's of course, great. before we before we wrap up with you, Natalie, we got to know his jockey club name. So that way we can follow you guys in your journey. What is your horse's name? So his jockey club name is Underscore and I call him Blueberry. <laughs> He's actually um, out of a mare named Unspurned, who I groomed at the auctions when she was uh, for sale as a yearling. She went to sale twice. She didn't sell either time. She ended up running for her breeders. I fell in love with her. I loved her brain. I loved the way that she processed the world around her. And I always thought, like, if I took on another riding horse, that's the brain I want. Except she didn't need me because she ended up being a stakes horse for her breeders. And so she had a breeding career waiting for her when she retired. And he is a lot like her. And people have told me that from the beginning. So I had followed him kind of from the beginning, wanting to know, like, you know, okay, well, he's a boy. He's going to have to do a whole lot more to have a breeding career than what she did. So he's more likely to need help after he's done or not help, but, you know, he's more likely to need someplace else to, to go after yeah. he's done. And yeah. it, it was so such an amazing not surprise, exactly, because I'd been emailing Godolphin. Um, he, he was bought by Godolphin at the sales, and I'd been emailing them sort of constantly, like, Hey, you know, if you decide you don't want to run this horse anymore, you could always call me. So it's well done, you. Good I pursuit finally got email. him. I love it. <laughs> it was it was so exciting. It, it feels like it was sort of years in the making just because I've been like following everything that he did, and I still kind of can't believe that he's mine. So it's no. it's an exciting thing every day to go out and snuggle with him and just be like, you're here, you're here. Oh, <laughs> definitely. It sounds like a perfect story in the making for sure. Natalie, thank you so much for coming on. If people want to follow you and your adventures with underscore, where can they find you? I guess the easiest place to find me is probably on the Pollock Report. Um, you can find me on Twitter at my username is at fly so free. It's a protected account, but I, I do check my follower requests. So you can um, follow me there and you'll probably be spammed with pictures of blueberry from time to time. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Natalie. We're looking forward to following mm. all your adventures and your training. Blueberry. And, uh, good luck on the makeover. <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have you entered your OTTB in the Retired Racehorse Project's Thoroughbred Sport Tracker? This user-driven database tracks thoroughbreds in second careers, and now, through February 19th, you have a chance to win $100 in RRP store credit by participating. Build your horse's profile and find contest details at the RRP. Dot org. And from the back of the pack on the outside, Commanding Curve is taken second, but California Chrome shines right in the Kentucky Derby! And now it's time for the new vocations Winner Circle Adoptable Horse of the Week. It's that time where we get to head over to Kentucky and talk to Leandra Cooper from New Vocations Racehorse Adoption and uh, talk to her about one of the dream boats that could potentially be yours. But before we do that, we get to jump in and ask her a training question. First of all, Leandra, hello. Hello. How are you? Everything is, is awesome here. How are things in Lexington? What's the what's the weather like? What are you living with these days? <laughs> Well, I can't complain since I grew up in the Northeast. This is should be a breeze, but I'm sure you guys know. Like, anywhere you go, you kind of acclimate to. So I could say that this is cold, but it's in the high 30s. So I'm sure I'd be last out of town. I think that's cold. I'll go with cold. I won't laugh at you. That seems that yeah. seems pretty <laughs> terrible. Um, and our producer's in Florida, so he's really feeling sorry for you. So we're not going <laughs> to laugh at you here. <laughs> so, so before we get to talking about this unbelievably adorable bay horse that we're going to talk about, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about the farrier. You know, a lot of racehorses come off the track, and when they come to me, 
most of them come with no problems with the farrier, but then there's some of them who have maybe had a bad experience or two and their time at the track may not have been, has been as educational as you would hope for a, Mm -hmm. a racehorse with the farrier. So when you guys get horses that are difficult for the farrier, what are some of the things that you guys do? Well, it really helps to have an experienced team on hand. So if you have somebody, like we're lucky here to have really experienced staff and a great farrier uh, with great a great assistant. They just kind of understand what they're working with. So they have a lot of patience and they have a sense of humor about things just because either way, we have a lot of young, young horses. So chances are they're not going to be perfect all the time. So just coming into it, having people who are experienced with young horses and or off the track thoroughbreds just can help. But this situation, I would say I approach with lots and lots of caution because I have tremendous respect for my farrier and understand that there are a lot of risks in their jobs. And I would like to mitigate all the risks that I can. Mm -hmm. But if there's a horse who's really misbehaving, we will likely use sedatives to one, um, stop that neuron firing process of stress for the horse, because you can, there is a way to not abuse sedatives with the horses, not, not just sort of like mask issues, but to pacify it so that they are used to, can experience an environment and not know that they don't have a stressful situation. So you can kind of use it as a tool to, um, to galvanize this calmness that they might not be able to do innately and also not put your farrier at risk. So you really have to gauge the severity of the situation. If it's really bad, you don't want people to get hurt. So you can use sedatives and sort of wean them off of it so that hopefully they will build up that neuro pathway that is saying, you know, every time I get into the situation, I'm not going to be stressed. So maybe if they've had stress, stressful situations and they're anticipating it, you need to actually reprogram their brain to change that behavioral pattern, like quite literally create a new pathway that, and reinforce it. So if you need to use that, do it because you need to have a good team. So that, that's one. Obviously, you, that can actually help. There are situations that escalate are usually when people use force to try to create calmness. It just doesn't work. So Those I would two say, things like, do not go together. No, force and calm not. are not two words that, that are mm. synonyms. Getting after them never results in, in a better result. I mean, even if you can sort of make the horse submissive in the moment, in the long run, it's just not going to pay off, but, um, giving them breaks. So a lot of the stress comes from when a horse is trying to pull their leg away and, and either an inexperienced farrier or a farrier lacking confidence that, you know, they might try to hang them there. There are moments when they can't put the foot down and that's understandable, but having somebody who is experienced and can work with them and give them breaks so they they can put their foot down can stop a lot of the problems in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then I would say from a handler standpoint, because you kind of have to have that team effort there, experienced handler, experienced farrier, and work together there, and just being able to read the horse before things get bad, especially if you know a horse is going to be nervous. But even with the vet, if we have a horse who's a little nervous, you know, every horse kind of likes a different um, stimulation around their head, but there is a kind of like handy trick that um, we use and that is just sort of tapping on their forehead between their eyes and it can just distract them enough that you can keep their mind off of something that is going to stress them so in this case if a horse starts getting a little anxious you know talking to them especially if they're familiar with you and just knocking on their forehead you know you're not pounding on it but it's just a little simple distraction Mm -hmm. similar to I'm sure people I saw kind of where people would put duct tape on their lips when the farrier was there and they kind of get distracted by the duct tape on their lips and they don't pay attention to anything around them. You can use distraction to your benefit, but really what at the base of what you're trying to do is reprogram their brain to have this different pattern of behavior and say, 
you know, this is, doesn't always have to go down the path of stress. This can be a relaxing, non-chaotic situation, but you have to create the conditions so that they build up that pathway option by repetition. Uh-huh. So you kind of have this heavy job of creating the happier situation and then letting that build up. So it's all about finding how to do that. But like I said, I don't mess around when it gets to the extremes of it. I would rather really um, use sedative strategically and create a, even an artificial sort of happy, calm situation and then wean them off of that, then put anyone in danger. So, well, and, a, you know. and there's two, like the, with the times where they do come to you with their race plates still on and you're like, okay, yeah. we've got to get these race plates off to be safe, but I haven't spent enough time working on your feet yet. So yeah, maybe the sedative is good for the first one. And then you've got six weeks to train the mm-hmm. horse yeah. to have its feet picked up. And that's kind of your job as a trainer. So I, I do, I like that. Again, it's just keeping everybody safe. You know, I mean, that's a, that's a tough job and, and you certainly don't want a good farrier to quit. Yeah. So that was, the, but in that's, the meantime, you know, just picking up the feet and just depending on what the horse's issue is, obviously, it, whether it's sort of like the whole situation or just being handled around there, but you can certainly do lots to, in the meantime, like you said, to get them used to that, picking up their feet um, when you're just walking around, you know, just making that part of your routine, just creating that condition, the scenario for for having this sort of easy, relaxed environment rather than stress. So figuring out what that trigger is and then just working on it. Yeah. Well, let's thank you so much for that. Let's move on to talk about, oh my goodness, this adorably cute bay horse. Now I, I was looking at him and I'm like, oh my gosh, this horse looks so familiar. Why, why, why? I don't know. Maybe because it looks just like his daddy, uncle Mo. Uncle Mo is, is not going to stamp a baby with a lot of Chrome, is he? Because he was a solid bay. And so is this one with those striking black points and this horse is 16 three and six years old he is ready to go yes so he is a horse who i mean definitely stands by uncle mo there and also has legs for miles he is mm-hmm. so funny to just see in a photograph because just in his appearance alone you know he's a horse who's obviously large, but also has this very square shape to him. He's not super long. He's very compact. He's very sporty looking. But even in the pictures, they kind of made me giggle when they came out because he is just legs for miles. But uh, Demo, as we call him around the barn, is just a horse with a lot of personality. He likes to get people's attention. He likes to keep their attention. So he is one who will routinely stick his tongue out even when he's just in the stall or hang his head out when you're passing by he's always trying to get your attention and keep it he would be the class clown for sure and he from the moment he got to us to the way he is now he's just this really easygoing personality he is very go with the flow he's not the dominant one in turnout he's more of a follower type but he has this really cool aura to him when you put him under saddle and he still acts very green. He had a little time off for a tendon injury and getting right back into work. So he has this, this sort of jester side of him, but you can just feel in his movement that he's really got this quality there. So we're really excited to see how he's developed and what he turns into with time and the right person, because I think that he is going to exceed all of our expectations. Yeah, he is adorable. And even though he did have a ten- tendon injury, it says here that Demopolis is still able to go on and have a, a low level jumping career. So it must not have been too terribly bad. Plus, he didn't race all that much. He only started twice with whopping earnings of $3,400. Watch out. I'm, the ladies are swooning <laughs> right now. <laughs> but he is adorable. He is available on horseadoption.com. Check out Demopolis or Demo, as you guys call it. Again, a 2014 Bay Gelding 16.3 with the whopping adoption fee of $1,000. All right. Well, Leandra, again, thank you so much for joining us and telling us about the horse and giving us a training tip. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. 
You can find our show notes and links to today's guests on the website of retiredracehorseradio.com. Like us on Facebook, just search for Retired Racehorse Radio. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio, or you can find my Facebook page, Flyover Farm Jamie Jennings Certified Monty Roberts Instructor, or email me at jamie at horseradionetwork.com. You can email me at joy at horseradionetwork.com or find me on Instagram at the foodie equestrian. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Kentucky Performance Products and Cashel Company. And don't forget to check out all the other shows on Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Remember to set your goals high and love to learn from every ride. And spay, neuter, and geld. Bye, guys. Bye.